and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Today I have a guest on the show and I am talking to Lisa Unger. Lisa is an emotional and eating disorder specialist and a level two EFT, emotional freedom technique practitioner. Now Lisa has been on her own healing journey and spent years trapped in a cycle of binging and restrictive eating, leading to self-loathing and unhappiness. But she found a path to recovery by combining various techniques with her innate strength and resilience. And today, Lisa embraces all foods without restriction and is no longer ashamed of her body. Using her skills in nutrition and psychology, Lisa now dedicates herself to empowering emotional eaters and those battling eating disorders to make long-term changes to the way they think about food and themselves. And with her support, Lisa gives them the freedom to regain control of their lives. Now, Lisa has found EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique, to be a transformative tool for many of her clients in reducing anxiety and enhancing their overall well-being during their recovery journey. And it's a technique that can be used in social settings as well, which so many of our clients have found to be invaluable. In the episode today, Lisa is going to talk about her own healing journey, and then she's going to do a deep dive into EFT. What is it? How can we learn it? How can it help? And then the integration of EFT as a strategy for managing anxiety and promoting healing and eating disorder recovery. Now, Lisa is going to bring some real practical examples of how to use EFT to manage fear foods, interrupt purging and feeling fat as examples. EFT can be such a valuable healing skill to add to your toolbox. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with Lisa today. Let's get to the conversation. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. So Lisa, could I firstly get you to introduce yourself to the listeners, please? Absolutely. So my name is Lisa Unger and I'm an emotional and eating disorder specialist. I use EFT tapping as part of the tools that I teach my clients. I have a basis of nutritional therapy and psychology and that's me really. (laughs) Okay, well, fantastic. And I know you're going to be going and talking a bit more about EFT, emotional freedom technique. And I'm super excited about that because as before we were going live, I was saying to you that I don't think I've ever actually had anyone talking about this before. And I know it's a tool, a skill that many people find hugely successful. Really, really pleased that you're going to be talking about that. But before we delve into that, Lisa, could you tell us a little bit about your own journey? Because I know you've been on your own sort of healing journey with food and body. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. When I was six, my elder brother, he passed away and obviously devastating to my parents, my family. And this was over 50 years ago. And in those days, you didn't have anybody to talk to any grief counsellors, it just didn't exist. And really, you were just supposed to get on with life. And I had seen my parents go through this torment and my older sister, and I just became the good girl. I didn't want to do anything that upset them further. I was quite shy anyway, and I just went into myself. What I'm telling you, I only know now because I've worked on myself, it's not anything that I obviously realised then. But what I've realised at six, you're not always a good girl. (laughs) You have emotions, you have feelings, you're maybe trying to overstep boundaries as you're maturing. And I never did any of that. I kept it all inside. I also was a very, very skinny child, but I found a lot of comfort in food. And I would secretly go into the kitchen and I would take things. And that was where my sort of secret binging started. When I started maturing and physically developing, my size just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I started dieting, or probably I was about 12 when I started dieting. And they were always these extreme diets. 
well, to begin with, and then I would do the normal slimming clubs. I even had injections, but I remember going for injections and I was about five and a half stone overweight. And I remember being just so unhappy that my mom took me to trying to help me, but took me to this clinic where they gave me injections and tablets. I didn't even know what I was taking, but I was so, so desperate to lose this weight and so unhappy never worked you'd lose it you'd put it on you'd put on more the same as all your listeners would have gone through but the trauma uh, that I felt and how much I really hated myself well you know when I think back it was just a really really sad time of my life anyway I went to university and I started going out with my now husband Mm -hmm. (laughs) and he just accepted me as I was and That was actually a big turning point for me, I think, because I'd been so shy and so hating myself. And here was somebody that I really loved and he was accepting me for me. And I think that really helped me start to accept me for me. I just changed the way I ate. I would eat really what we would call sensibly normally using that kind of language in the week. And then on weekends, I would eat whatever I wanted because he would come up and visit me and we'd go out and whatever and gradually the weight really went off but I realize now that actually my eating disorder was still with me because I was very very controlling in the week I'm saying I ate normally no I was really controlling and when I had my children my first child I realized how controlling not only was I over myself, but I was so controlling over her because I was so scared that she was going to have a weight problem that I did. It wasn't about the weight. It was about the unhappiness. And I remember that I didn't give her a single biscuit, a single rusk, nothing that was at all could have had any sugar in it or anything until she was about 18 months. And I learned my lesson because I took her to a, well, in fact, I started a play group with a friend of mine. And at your half time, we used to put out biscuits. And my daughter would not go and play with anything. She would lie under the table, hanging onto the table leg, waiting for the biscuits. And I think that taught me a really big lesson about restriction. And it was a gradual process of letting go of all my rules, letting go of all my restrictions. And then, I studied nutrition, I studied psychology, then I worked and whatever. And then I studied nutrition later in life. To begin with, I thought, I know I'm going to help people with weight loss. That's what I know. And it felt so uncomfortable because I just didn't feel comfortable telling people, yeah, don't eat that or only have a little bit of that. And that's when I went into studying eating disorders. And yeah, I just really feel that I found this is what I want to do because When I look back at that unhappiness of me as a child, as I said, it wasn't about really about my weight. It was about the way I was eating and all the emotions and all the emotions and how it led to my behaviors, if you like. That's the bit we're working on now. Yes, we talk a little bit about what to eat, but it's not about banning foods. It's not about restricting what you eat it's about actually learning how to eat and then it's about learning how to reframe some of those thoughts you have about yourself and about food in general it's about learning not to judge yourself harshly we judge ourselves very harshly it's about changing habits it's about all the if you like the psychological side of our behavior That's what we really need to work on. And that's what I'm really thrilled to help people do. Oh, thank you so much for sharing, Lisa. And I'm very struck by the fact that you have really been on quite a testing journey through life, haven't you? Which has ultimately, though, led you to a place where you're going to have so much empathy and understanding with your clients. Because I'm sort of thinking that six years old, losing your older brother, I mean, just how devastating and what a massive loss for you and your family to have to deal with. And it's no wonder, is it, that you found some way of trying to cope with that? Absolutely. And you don't even understand that that's what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. You're just trying to survive. 
there's no judgment of my parents who really try obviously they try to do everything and I think that that's really important that when you're talking to your clients as well there's just no judgment in there of anybody because everybody is doing the best they can with the tools that they have it's just sometimes they're not always the right tools yeah no it's so true isn't it I think the more I work in this field the more I have so much compassion for humans generally because I sort of think you know back to our parents grandparents generation mental health just wasn't a thing was it you just had to sort of get on with it pretend everything was fine if you did disclose any mental health concerns you're probably seen as a bit crazy there's a lot of shame so many people are sort of carrying just so much trauma aren't they and never had their own needs and emotions and things validated so yeah, I'm so with you in a way. People are doing the best they can, but at the same time, as that little six-year-old, it's so understandable that you would have been struggling. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, I think as well what I'm really struck by with your story is the fact that when you met your husband and the power of that relationship, that sort of co-regulation mm-hmm. and feeling acceptance, and I think that's such an important part, isn't it, along the healing journey, having other people where we really can feel safe and be ourselves. Only ever, ever (laughs) made one comment and he never made it again. He said to me (laughs) once that I couldn't sit on his lap because I'd break his knees. (laughs) And he was saying it as a joke, like not to, he's a very kind person. He was never saying it to humiliate me or anything like that. But I think he saw how upset I was and he never, ever, ever said anything like that again. I mean, it's our 40th wedding anniversary next year. So I have to feel that he learned his lesson. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. (laughs) I'm so pleased, actually, it sounds that, yeah, your relationship with him has been a really integral part of the journey. But then it sounds as well, I think, the whole process of you perhaps focusing initially more on the nutrition, but then moving more into the psychology and the deeper issues and really understanding like that's where the work needs to be done. Mm, Definitely. That is the major part of what we do, really. Yeah, and it's so true. Time for a short advertisement break. On the outside, you have it all together. You're successful. You seem happy. What your friends and family don't see is that you're living in the vicious cycle of bulimia. You know that something needs to change. Your health depends on it, but you just don't know where to start or how to move forward. That's where Conquering Bulimia comes in. It's a -a one-of-a-kind online recovery course brought to you by certified eating disorder coaches, Sarah Lee and Merritt Elizabeth. They know exactly what you're going through. They've both recovered from bulimia and have teamed up with leading experts to create an online course with over 70 videos as a powerful addition to your recovery. Conquering Bulimia is private and self-paced, filled with personal stories and coaching tips that will teach you how to change your behaviours for good. It will challenge and inspire you and it's affordable, offered at an incredible discount of over 60% of the cost of one-on-one coaching break free from bulimia on your terms and start living the life of peace you deserve at conqueringbulimia.com. Lisa, could you tell us a little bit about what is EFT, Emotional Freedom Technique? If you can tell us almost like from a complete beginner's perspective, because I'm sure a lot of listeners may have not heard about it. Absolutely. So as you said, EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Technique, and some people might know it as tapping. And it was developed sort of in the 1970s. It sort of is a mixture of, I don't know, Chinese medicine and psychology, really. If you imagine in your body, if you might look at, think of how your veins travel through your body, we also have meridians. And I imagine them in the same way, these meridians, sort of these channels running through our body. But meridians are channels of energy. and Meridians, they associated with particular functions and organs, and we need them to flow and be balanced because that's going to maintain our physical and emotional health. And if we get blockages in these pathways, it can really affect how we behave. That's partly the Chinese medicine, if you like. And where we're tapping, we tap with our fingers and where we're tapping are these acupuncture pressure points that we know about from Chinese medicine. But where the psychology comes in is where you have these blockages, these negative emotions, negative thoughts, what we're going to be doing is clearing those 
by tapping on them. What we do when we're tapping is we start off with, it's called a setup statement. And all it is, is you tap. You tap with either two or three fingers, whatever's comfortable for you. And to begin with, we're tapping on our karate chop, you know, on the side of our hand. And to me, the setup statement is almost like bringing calm into our bodies and letting our brain know what to expect. You can just tap on the side of your hand and just breathe slowly in and out. We say a sort of setup statement was, which is whatever the issue that we've been, let's say you're very anxious. You use the setup, you know, even though I'm feeling really anxious, I'm okay, kind of thing. That's the kind of thing you're saying. And then we tap with our two or three fingers around these acupuncture pressure points around our, we start around our face, where our eyebrow meets our nose, the side of the eye, under the eye, under the nose, your chin, just under your collarbone under your arm and then on the top of your head. And you might go through a couple of two or three routines to do this tapping. Yeah, no, maybe I can pick up on a few bits actually, just to clarify even more. So if someone is like, so listening to this, you're explaining where the points are. Is there Mm. like a visual somewhere as well where you can get information on the different meridian, is it meridian points that you would tap on? Yes, I have like a little handout which has sort of, if you like, the script, and it also has the points on, which I can send you. I'm happy to give you, and you can give it to people. But I will find one. I don't know of one. (laughs) I'm sure it's very freely available. There's lots of people doing tapping on YouTube, which you can follow along with if you just do a search on that. You're happy to share your sheet. That would be brilliant. And I can make it available in the show notes. Definitely, That'd be fantastic. But it sounds like as well, if you kind of Google um, emotional freedom technique, EFT, Mm. there's lots of YouTube videos where people can literally observe someone and kind of copy them or sort of follow along as they're sort of learning the technique. Absolutely. Where this technique is really useful for people with disordered eating or eating disorders or any emotional struggles is that EFT relieves the stress and anxiety that we have. For example, I talked about my own trauma. It can help with if you've had a trauma or negative experience, which may have added to your disordered eating or eating disorder, it can really help. But in that instance, I would say, please, please, please go and see a therapist. Don't try and do that on your own, because it is a big thing to break down. And it's really hard to do that on your own. Many people I come across are really scared about eating certain foods. For example, for years we've been told not to eat carbohydrates. Eating carbohydrates, automatically going to put on weight. And if you're going somewhere and all you can eat is a sandwich, that can cause people a lot of stress. Tapping can really help overcome these fears and phobias around food. It also really helps with binging and purging behaviors. When we are trying to delay purging, for example, or trying to delay a binge, we can feel really anxious, really stressed. Tapping is something that you can do that is not only going to help you relax, but it's also going to help take away that urge. Many people, especially if they've had maybe anorexia nervosa or there's somebody like me who used to do my binging absolutely secretively. Going into, let's say, a restaurant or a social situation, you often feel quite judged. People are going to be looking at what I'm eating or even the thought of eating in public can make people feel really anxious and nauseous. That's where tapping can really help you overcome that anxiety. And it acts as an alternative coping mechanism to uncomfortable feelings and emotions. And it can really help reduce cravings. So I sometimes do a tapping sequence around a craving for chocolate. It's like, if you're thinking, I really want that chocolate. Okay, how much do you want that chocolate out of 10? Eight out of 10. Okay, and you do this whole tapping sequence, which is really, I really want that chocolate. I'm really craving that chocolate, whatever. And you do that a few times. Honestly, that craving really, really diminishes. It's had so much success with it. And it's not about, I don't want chocolate anymore. It's about giving you the choice 
of whether you want to eat the chocolate. And I think when we've got a real urge, the, the choice goes. It's like, I've got to have it. There is no choice. Even if I think I'm actually full and I don't want it, but I really, really have that craving for it. Well, tapping can help take away the craving. So at the end of it, you can say, well, actually, do I want that chocolate or not? And if you do, that's fine. You sit and you eat it and you enjoy it. But if you don't want it, you don't have to have it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it really makes sense, doesn't it? Like you say, sometimes in that situation, it can feel like this choice has gone in a way. It just feels like this Mm -hmm. urge, but it's almost like the tapping kind of regulates you and brings you back to centre so you can tap into your wisdom, I guess, and your intuition Mm -hmm. and think, yeah, do I want it or not? (laughs) Absolutely. And the other thing it can help you with is something that's said to me a lot, and I felt myself, that feeling of feeling fat. I feel fat. And often feeling fat is not a thing. It's actually what we're feeling underneath that is causing the feeling fat. So it can be that we're, I don't know, just feeling really underconfident, that we're feeling really stressed. And then we've eaten something and there we go. Now I feel so fat. Well, tapping really helps with those kinds of emotions. It can really help you I suppose, identify more what's going on and diminish the feeling fat. The great thing about tapping, because I've used examples there saying it can help you when you're going to a social event. Well, I'm not expecting you to be tapping around your face at a social event. But the fantastic thing about tapping when you've learned the technique is it's portable and you can do it in a way People don't know what you're doing. They can't see what you're doing. So an example is if you're sitting in a restaurant and you're feeling really anxious, you can squeeze on the sides of your fingers or tap on them under the table where no one can see because you have these meridians running through your fingers. So you're still being able to, if you like, get the benefits of tapping without doing it around your face, just by very gently squeezing the sides of your fingers. And if you do them like it in order, maybe start with your little finger and work through your hand, just squeezing very gently, but so that you feel it, or you can tap with your other hand on the sides of your fingers. If you only had one hand onto the table or you were standing up at a cocktail party talking to someone, if you take your thumb and you rub at the edges of your fingers, you're going to be massaging, if you like, the meridians going through your fingers and that can be very soothing. So when you're doing it, try and slow your breath and that can really have a good effect. I've noticed sometimes when you're somewhere, you notice people, I don't know, tapping on their chin, for example, with two or three fingers and you're just thinking, oh, you know, well, you don't really think about it, but they're often tapping. But they're doing it in a very unobtrusive way, and whereas most people looking at them wouldn't know what they were doing. Again, you can tap on one of the points, and the chin, I think, is quite a good one because, again, you could be doing anything. So that's another reason that I really, really like EFT. It's just something that you can take with you. It's free. You can do it wherever you are. Yeah, that sounds fantastic, isn't it? Like a kind of portable practice, really, that you can use at any time, anywhere. Yeah, I do think that's just brilliant. And just knowing that you have this tool that you can use, as I said, wherever, just gives you enormous confidence. Actually, I can manage this. I want to add that I am not somebody who one would think of being sort of alternative. I've never been somebody who particularly believed or practiced anything alternative. And the reason I became an EFT practitioner was purely because I heard it was very good for people with disordered eating and eating disorders. And I'm always looking for extra tools that I can pass on to my clients and also help me and help myself. And I was blown away with its effectiveness. Honestly, part of learning to be a practitioner, you have to practice on yourself. Things that I had been hung up on all my life. I was able to work with with the tapping and it just blew me away. I still sometimes have cravings. I still sometimes eat too much and feel fat, honestly. But I am able not to let it affect me by using this technique. 
this technique has really helped me. I do it with all my clients now as part of what we're doing. It's not the whole thing, but it's part of what we're working with. And and as I say, to me, the more tools we have in that toolbox, the better it's going to be. Yeah, and it sure does. Sounds fantastic. And it is sort of backed, isn't it, by science? Like, I think there's not tons of studies. I mean, I'm not up on this at all, but there are some scientific studies, aren't there, that sort of show that it lowers cortisol and is actually having a beneficial sort of physiological and psychological impact? Yes, definitely. There are. When we're doing something that is totally harmless, um, like this, and if it helps us, then all well and good. We're not harming ourselves. We're not harming anyone else. We're not spending money on it. It's just a tool that we have that works. Then I think let's just go for it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) In terms of like making it like a practice in one's life, like obviously you've talked about situations where certain feelings come up or cravings or feeling fat. So obviously you could utilize the tools if possible in that moment. But Otherwise, would you have it as a sort of daily practice with your clients or is it more something you call upon when you're in a situation? I think to be able to use it in a situation, you have to have practiced it beforehand. And lots of people use it as a daily practice. We talk about meditation as self-care and going for a walk as self-care and tapping can be one of those self-care practices as well it doesn't have to take an hour it can take 10 minutes I do encourage it I encourage people to practice and to use it everybody that I've ever done it with has said how calming and relaxing it is and we all need a bit of calm and relaxation in our life so I do definitely recommend it as a daily 10 minute practice but also you know if there's things that emotional struggles then keep using it for that If you imagine that you were scared of flying, EFT is often used for people that are scared of flying. And if you imagine that the fear of flying is a tabletop with lots of table legs, we can't just tap generally on the fear of flying because what is it about flying that's making you scared? Is it that you don't like it when they take away the steps? Is it when they shut the door? Is it when the air stewardess says, fasten your seatbelt? You have to tap on all those different aspects for the table to fall down to lose the fear of flying if we're having emotional struggles we need to break it down and find all the different areas of this one struggle if you like to be able to use tapping to really get it to fall down in that instant that does take time and practice it's not just a general thing sure and I guess that's when perhaps if you are in therapy or you're having coaching or something you may work with that professional to sort of tease out some of the complexities and nuances of your fear so you can really channel the tapping and the statements in a way that's going to really serve you personally. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. If you're just trying to reduce the anxiety around food, then I feel that is something the more that you could work on on your own. Sure. And in terms of the statements that you say, Can you give us an example? Say if someone is anxious about eating donuts or something, what would be an example statement that one might use when you're doing this happening? Okay. The setup statement, I would say something like, even though I'm really scared of eating this donut, I'm okay. Just trying to slow my breathing down. And I would say that kind of thing probably three times, like even though this donut is causing me a lot of stress, I'm okay. Then I would be thinking about this donut and thinking about what is it that I'm scared of. And as I'm tapping around my face, I'd be going, this sugary donut, it's lots of calories, it's causing me anxiety, I can feel the tension in my chest, I can feel the nausea in my stomach. This donut is causing me stress. And then I'd go again and go, I can feel this tightness in my chest. I can feel the nausea in my stomach when I think about this donut, when I think about the sugar, when I think about the jam. You're pulling out all the aspects of the donut that is causing you the stress and the anxiety. 
So there's a lot of repetition in there, but I might still say it two or three times. Before I start, I'm going to rate how much anxiety that donut is causing me out of 10. I'm going to tap round just like I described now, maybe two or three times and see if that number has come down. I'm also going to be thinking about, okay, where am I feeling the anxiety? So am I feeling it in my chest? Am I feeling it in my stomach, as I said? Am I feeling it in my hands? Do I feel sweaty? And actually, it's almost like, if you like, the symptoms of what the stress and anxiety, thinking about the donut, is causing me that I'm going to be tapping on. So I can feel that my breathing is quicker. I'm feeling sick in my stomach when I think about this donut. And also, as you tap on it, sometimes the feeling changes. So for example, you might have been feeling the tightness in your chest, but then the tightness moves to your neck. So the second time that you're going to be doing this, you sort of start talking about, okay, I can now feel this in my neck, this tension, this shooting pain, whatever it is, you're tapping on that. So you do the setup statement and you tap three sequences, let's say, you breathe and then you say, okay, how do I rate myself now? And you think about where you're feeling the anxiety. You think about, again, the donut. What is it about the donut that's causing you the anxiety? And you might go again. And the number might usually comes down again. It might not. And you don't need to stress about it. You just keep going until the number comes down. And when it gets to about four out of 10, for example, you can say, even though I still have this anxiety, when I think about a donut, but it's reducing and I still have a little bit of feeling in my stomach and I still have a little bit of pain in my neck. When it gets down to like a one or two out of 10, you can finish because it continues working even when you've stopped tapping. Well, that's really helpful just talking through that. And when you're saying the anxious statement, so, you know, even though I'm really worried about eating this donut and all the sugar and fat, et cetera, Do you always follow it with a then sort of supportive statement of making yourself feel safe or not necessarily? Can you just verbalize the kind of anxiety? You always do. You say, even though I'm feeling this, I accept. You don't have to say I'm okay. I feel that's a good one. But you can say things like, I accept this is how I'm feeling or despite feeling this anxiety, things like that. But everything that you're saying to yourself comes with compassion. So we do need to accept that we're okay and that it's okay to have these feelings. Yeah, no, sure. So you're allowing the feelings, aren't you? But then you're also kind of saying, offering yourself compassion, acceptance, a feeling of safety in the body or moving yeah. towards safety in the body. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. It's really interesting, Lisa, just to sort of hear you talking through this because of, I'm sure some people listening may have tried it but I think for a lot of people they may have heard of EFT but perhaps they have never actually put it into practice or maybe this is a bit woo woo or not really understood the benefits and how they can practically access it at home when they're out and about just even experiment with it for the first time. Absolutely as I said it wasn't something that I thought I thought well I'm just going to do it because I've heard it's good I've been blown away how effective it can be and how useful. Well, thank you so much. And is there anything else that you wanted to add about the whole kind of topic, anything we haven't touched on? I don't think so. I just want to encourage people to keep an open mind and just try it because it might help. If it doesn't, they don't have to do it again. But I would say do it if you're going to go for it. Say, okay, I'm going to try it for a week. Don't just try it once because... Sometimes it can take a little bit of a time for our brain and our body to understand what it is that we're giving them. So if you're doing it on your own, just give yourself a week and say, right, I'm going to try this three times this week and see what happens. Always rate yourself when you start. And just what you're looking for is to see if the numbers come down. So rate yourself out of 10. See what happens. Let us know. (laughs) Yeah, they're fantastic. And I think, yeah, the rating yourself bit as well, that is really important, isn't it? Because I think so often with things, we sort of try them perhaps with not a lot of awareness. Perhaps we think it doesn't work and we kind of give Mm. up. But with anything, isn't it? We need to like have practice and repetition. And actually, when you're really tuning in to has my anxiety shifted, almost it's like a curious experiment, isn't it? And that's quite empowering, isn't it? Because I'm sure as well, 
people will develop their own individual style and techniques of using the overall kind of method, won't they? And in terms of what works for them. And that's really empowering as well, isn't it, to kind of be on your own journey of exploring and finding out how you can really utilize this for yourself. Absolutely. Definitely. Because it's there all the time. That's its benefit as well, that you can use it just to relax. You can use it just as a form of self-care. But when you really need it, you can use it in any situation. Yeah, no, fantastic. So Lisa, where can people find you if they would like to get in touch, maybe book a session with you, ask you questions as follow up to the podcast? Where's the best place? Thank you. So I'm on Instagram, underscore Lisa Unger, or online, my website. You can contact me through there, lisaunger.co.uk. Okay, no, lovely. And I'm guessing there's probably a bit, I think a bit like with my name, there's not many frues out there. There are probably not that many ungers out there, are there? I don't know. Oh, no, I don't <laughs> think there are. There's not that many of us. It's yeah. E-R, not A-R. It's like hunger without the H. <laughs> yeah, no, lovely. <laughs> yeah, very appropriate. <laughs> okay, Lisa, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Really appreciate you talking through all of that. I think just hearing your story and everything you've been through and the journey you've walked on and then how that's really sort of lit you up with your passion and purpose today and then also really talking us through this technique I think it's going to really inspire a lot of people um so thank you so much oh thank you so much for having me so I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did do go and check out all of Lisa's details in the show notes and also like her handout, which we mentioned in the podcast, which can really give you some guidance around using EFT. If you're not following me already on Instagram, do seek me out the eating disorder therapist underscore. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you're a professional listening, you may want to sign up for my body image or eating disorder courses, which are now online. Links are in the show notes. And if you enjoy this podcast, I would be so grateful if you would follow, rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners. Thank you so much for listening today. And I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon.